you again to Christina. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> we'll remind everybody we have a merch table in the back, back, in the back of the performance area, not really, the back of the store. Um, we got books. Uh, we have the Scare Me anthology since this is October and people are supposed to be scared during October. So um, you pick up that. Um, any book you buy tonight will be a dollar off as per our flyers. So if you want to get one, or I'll just like make it an even five or whatever. Um, we also have t-shirts, um, some of our mixed media books because we're kind of expanding into just beyond just poetry into poetry and images. And also, um, Allergic to Everything by Leah Mueller. We just released a mixed media of hers. We don't have any stock because it just released yesterday. So maybe get a preview with that. It'll be fun. Uh, we also have a sign up sheet. If you're interested in getting text alerts, I sent the first um, text alert today about uh, the show tonight. And I'm going to try to send them once a week just to be like, hey, we have this show coming up. Or hey, we have this other show coming up. Speaking of this other show coming up, tomorrow, as part of the DeBoards Halloween Festival, we will be up in Akron. Do you know what the name of the park is? I think it's at Lock 3, isn't it? Lock 3? I'm not sure what that means. If you look up um, DeBoards Halloween Festival on Facebook or it's Google. Lock 3. It's near the baseball field. That could be it. It could be near the baseball yeah. field. DeBoards is D-E-B-O-R-D apostrophe S. Yes, DeBoards. <laughs> um, they're on Facebook. They're on the internet. Uh, I will be there, Skylark will be there, Daria will be there, possibly Keely Alia, one of our younger poets, uh, possibly our storyteller champion from the Grand Tournament, Rory M. Stone, um, possibly someone else. So you gotta show up to find out who's gonna be there. You have to sh basically you have to show up to find out who's gonna be there. Like, we're gonna record it probably, but I mean, maybe not, you never know. Um, also, while I got you here, before we bring up our next performer, November 10th, we have three amazing performers coming in right here at the local. Whoop, whoop. Uh, we have Mr. Mark Mannheimer, who is, oh, sorry, I gotta read this right. I put it on the flyer this way and I started to read it. Local singer songwriter Gorgio Days songs are based on real life experiences, telling emotional stories. We met her uh, a couple weeks ago. Well, I met her. I don't know if you actually talked to her. I don't remember. But uh, at a uh, at a friend of ours uh, art opening. Um, so yeah, she was singing. She was nice. Uh, Vince Robinson, one of the uh, more prolific Cleveland poets, he blazes the esoteric. So you definitely want to see that. And then of course, Mr. Mark Mannheimer, <laughs> who was never at a loss for. Uh, it's not on the plan. That's the way you submitted it. <laughs> I didn't mean to trick you there. The best time to write is here. The best place to write is you. Here. The best people to write are here. The best people to write are here. Yes, they are. <laughs> the, the prompts are on the back of your class. Our next performer, well, you came. So you could find out why his name is T-shirt. <laughs> 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 Woo! Hello. Hello. For a man named T-shirt, you're not wearing it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he defies convention. That, that's a thing. Well, let's slide this over here. So he didn't want everyone to swoon over his manly muscles. Yeah, ah. I, I was getting objectified at, at my at my first poetry, or, I guess second poetry reading in, in Columbus. Um, it was just funny um, because I didn't know who, they didn't know who I was. So um, they were like, "Who's this person on the list?" And we were going through the list because they don't they don't just go in order they kind of pick. It, right? And they're like, "Who's this?" I'm like, you know, T-shirt. <laughs> I had this tight T-shirt on. So she's like, "Oh, T-shirt." <laughs> it, it was a whole thing. So, oh, so that's why. So that's why. Yeah. Um, so I'm T-shirt. Jordan. So now we know why your t-shirt and we can leave now, right? No. So I'm from Columbus. Um, I'm a poet. Um, I actually started doing my, my performance career started with Writing Nights originally out in uh, 
out here. Uh, okay. Lakewood. At Lakewood, actually. Lakewood, actually. Bella Debbie. Uh, what was it? Bella Debbie. Bella Debbie, that's yes. what it was, yeah. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach back a little bit and read some of those um, from way back when. And I'm a very different person now. Um, not a different person, but I have a very different focus now. Um, so yeah, here's one of these. This one's called Fleeing in the Night, and I've actually recently edited this for this occasion. Oh, setting sun. Please turn back your course or let me push down these mountains. They hide your loving warmth. I catch, I catch a glimpse of you long enough to fall into your spell. The clouds now block my view. Oh, great one, grant me wings to soar above these burdens, high into the ionosphere. Far above this cursed land, I walk where obstacles are like brazen notes from a jazz saxophone. And each, each one strikes in my spine, sending my mind into a flurry, shutting me in the pages of my life's libretto, darkness and haze. Closed in this book, lost from a gaze, a tremble, I'm shook. Setting sun, save me from the moon as, as it chases me as I do you. It slowly approaches dancing in the midnight sky's blue hue. My journey keeps me up at night, so long that in a normal waking hour, everyone wakes but me. And when the end of day is near, I awaken to your sight. Oh, so radiant, the start of my plight. I stretch, stretch, yawn, and rise. I close my eyes, and you've rocketed it off with no goodbye. Here initiates my flea in the night. series that I was writing at the time. Um, so here's a cohesive uh, jumping on it. It's called Adonis Knot. I've tapped many outer thighs in my day, soft and quick. Yes, I've caressed the girls I've known to, I've grown to know and resent. They know my touch, pretentious and most certainly amazing. One day, a girl stumbled into my life quite unfamiliar to my touch, she knew not. Ouch was the word she uttered most repressively. I was frightened. I withdrew my hand, realizing that I had caused true harm. Her face assured me that it wasn't all right. Remorse filled and sorrowful, I tried to comfort her and beg for forgiveness, but she turned a cold shoulder. She wore skirts four inches too long to be the fashion. Her sweaters left her, left her handless, just limbs of navy blues, grays and black, with hair so long it had worn grease stains into the small of her back. She never flipped it to clear her vision and always walked as if she was on a mission always had a destination it seemed or maybe that's all it was a facade of busy so that she had no time to think to think of the tap on her on her heavily bruised outer thighs to think of the bloody tissue she hides in the bottom of garbage cans in her in her home mother doesn't know father doesn't care and i am just a boy it's as if her bangs had been tied around bricks of uncertainty, circumstance, and fear. They're so heavy, they keep her neck painfully bent. She can't see where she's going. She keeps running into walls of thrusts and pulls and slides and grabs, crying all the while, slipping on her tears, and I standing, a Adonis-like figure of bravado, charm, and grace. I, ignorant to the signs, playing school hall games. I, pillar of wide-eyed delight, and just a boy. moments where something is jarring enough to make you really think about yourself and like what you're doing in that moment. Um, and I had and that is essentially one of those moments where I actually got to know this person, understand what was going on, <laughs> and like really had to rethink what I was doing at 17 years old. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take a reprieve from the old <coughs> some new stuff at you. So I'm, a, I'm pretty political um, in a lot of my poetry. Um, I think all of, I think, I think all poetry is political, to be honest. Um, but specifically, I talk a lot about capitalism, a lot about queerness, and a lot about being black in America. Um, so you'll hear a lot of that coming soon. Um, let's start with this one. And uh, I did a poetry, you know, the 30 for 30, during Poetry Month, and I was doing Radiohead lyrics. 
Um, so I did 30 poems, pulling out a Radiohead lyric and just doing a poem based on that. So this one's called, uh, this is from the new album, by Moon Jay Pool, uh, Dreamers, They Never Learn, and We Are Just Happy to Serve. From Daydreaming. Our hands hold no vacancy. Born to be occupied, our hands hold anything but nothing. Connected through impulsive thumbtaps, Morse made sedative. This is programming, and this is easy. We find comfort in easy, the simplicity of decisions made for you, by decisions made before you, for you to make decisions for you. And anyone who knows that, knows you, makes those too. We find ourselves holding on digit by digit, survival of the fittest. It's only the thieves who thrive. While the good of us parade through, giving in and up, counting the moments and flow, forgetting time is limited and that life is to be lived. We kill time and we kill life. We succumb to brief pleasure repeatedly, filling others' pockets with our units of freedom, measured like coal and burn off to purchase more bait, more shackles, and more prisons. We know the forms, but this is easy, and easy does it. This thing that became us long ago, this thing that becomes every American newborn soul is capitalism. <laughs> so next time you become figurine, when you're asked to be put on display to hold the universe together for might be friend, wanna be lover, when you're summoned for appearance sake, your glitter and visual ecstasy, that, that, the kind that doesn't sit right with your relationer, but is ever so telling to outer folk that they have status and walk with gods. Adonis statues were never meant to be dragged so next time you receive a text message expecting the vagueness of their situation to conjure your presence, that because it's your day off and celebration is in order, you'll come of your own volition, that you're not particularly wanted, but you couldn't hurt. Next time you feel the talons of emotion not too distant, the pain of what could be and what hasn't been, the yearning for public closeness, the kind that leaves you aching through the next work week, tell them you're busy. Like I said, I'm But sometimes you get into those things and people are just like, hey, we're at the bar. You can come out. It's bad for your heart. Here's a here's my most recent poem. I actually stopped writing for a little while. Not purposefully, but like I, I'm in a band as well. Um, so I write music and lyrics and sing and do all those things. Um, so that's been taking over my life. So this most recent one is about an old, old, old relationship, but um, <coughs> came to light in the right way. It's called I Am No Holiday. I can't sleep without memories of you grabbing at my soul. Maybe it's me. I make attempts to stay the real and bed with intoxicated lovers wide awake, trying to milk their dead weight for an ounce of forgetting. My efforts are rarely fruitful, still empty as, the, as a flowerless vase. I imagine you sound asleep, having said your peace, divested your love. There are new hands peeling all the you that I remember away in an effort to restore you in their likeness. I feel their success is imminent. I know I'm no holiday. I can never afford to be. I, can, I don't even celebrate them anymore. 
I couldn't tell you the last time something festive drew a smile from me, or even the last time I visited home. I'm destined to live a salt life, having dreams where I'm hugging you at bad angles, only to recognize that my loss of sanity, enough to realize you reaching for Navidad, and my hug is much less that, much more desperate cling to yesterday's last night, to yesterday's last night slow dances in your room. It felt like our room, it felt like promise, like hand in hand, like fruition, like my parents had no effect on my destiny. It felt, and now, Yeah, I, I like to drop off the poem, like just let it sit there. So I apologize it's a little, a little awkward. <laughs> uh, the cliffhangers are what hurt me the most. So, <laughs> so I put them up. Um, because life has a lot of cliffhangers. Um, and let's, now that we're sad, let's continue on that trail and um, talk about. Like, no, this is uh, seven things. Um, seven things. It's seven things. <laughs> My love life is an embarrassment better buried, like a body in sheets that stays far into the afternoon, forgets to shower, eat, or call. Only waking for warm, disposable baddies. No thoughts of future retention, no future, just intention. The sweaty, random, late night kind. The ones who swipe right and fall over the edge of their online personas into, into, brief, bleep, into brief pleasure, comfort. Call them arms. Work is too real for story. It is only repetition of the same experience, feelings, and situations, and yearnings. Only a reminder of my inadequacies, how my lack of self-sufficiency makes me a puppet, dancing only when the strings are pulled, how my bootstraps have never been pulled, how I'd rather not hold myself up at all, how I'm going to die anyway. Here is something I won't talk about. I can't remember the last time I wrote anything new or well, ironic. I read headlines and feel a rush of blood to my heart, feel the adrenaline shake my bones. I lose control of my body, not in the frantic, I need to write way, in the hesitant, I wish I didn't have so much to write about way, and the instant wave of exhaustive depression that follows. I can't reconcile my thoughts with time alone in my room. I haven't the counsel for my rage. Here is something that I can't talk about. Six. I call family and forget the hot topics, treat them like strangers, strangers I don't want to offend with my changes. I'm not who they knew three years ago. I fear secrets they hold under their tongue and hide in I miss you. In these moments, my authenticity curls into a ball and lodges in my throat. I breathe shallow breaths and let the words float out hollow. I miss you too. Seven, what I really miss is hiding. Mm. Do what you want to do. Do what I want to do. Don't tell me that. Do what you want to do. Only we're limited is 9 o'clock. I'm not 50 or 49 minutes away. So let's get back to um, things that make me angry, actually. So sad. So um, <clears throat> I wrote some poems about oh. some, uh, some of the slain black young men. Um, at the hands of police. And it's um, very pretty heavy. So this first part is a four part poem. Um, First one's about Philando Castile, young man gunned down in the car from his wife and, and her girlfriend and daughter in the car with him. Um, had a CCW, CCW advised the police officer he had it. He was shot, officer shot. Second one is Al Alfredo Longo, um, a, a 
a black man who's lived with his sister, who was having a fit, um, like a psychotic fit. Um, she called the police because she she was hesitant to call the police, but she called the police anyway because she she, she knew that he needed help. They arrive on the scene, shoot him down. The third one is Tyree King from Columbus, uh, young young boy was into some pretty rough stuff, was running away from the police, um, and was shot in the back and in the side of the head, killed. Um, and the fourth one is uh, Ter Terrence Crutcher. Um, he, well, he had car trouble, and they approached his car as it was in, in, the, in the road. Um, female officer at the time got scared of something. <laughs> she thought he was reaching for something and shot him down. Um, and then the last one is uh, someone who should have said name as me. His name is Jordan Edwards, um, who was a young boy who was leaving a party, and the cop comes out of the house with a rifle and shoots the exiting car. And shoots in the back of the head. So <clears throat> this is a pretty heavy, heavy uh, run. So let's just get into that. <laughs> um, but also, let's think about these situations. So this first four-part thing is, uh, <coughs> I called them to help him, and the help he got was a bullet. One, don't look suspicious. Don't look at all. State your hashtag for the record. Don't make eye contact, don't make anything. State your hashtag for humanity. Notify of your compliance, notify of everything. State your hashtag for reputation. Keep hands visible at all times. Keep hands still. State your hashtag for trust. Obey. Two, I wish to never know the feeling of sister in fevered weight ever questioning the decision to call for armed help when her brother's demons rise to become him. I wish to never know the feeling of brother in heat, hands flailing toward a savior, skin crawling for escape, laced to freedom by bullets, turned angel in the sun. I wish to never know the feeling of sister covered in tears, feet away from brother, outside a wall of blue, praying the demons back into the holes they escaped. Three, don't run, boy. You guilty or something? I know your mama taught you better. Don't run, boy. Them lights got you wanting the ghost now. Them sirens mean something to you. What you think, you a track star now? Ain't you know this race is rigged? Don't run, boy. You gun shy? Ain't nobody tell you bullets ain't slow? Ain't nobody tell you blue means curfew? Ain't nobody tell you blue ain't nothing to exist in front of? Don't run, boy. Where do you think you're going anyway? Can you ever run fast enough? Four. Car trouble should never be a death sentence, but I guess we sign up for that. You can only hope it's the car's fault. Only pray that the Samaritan sent to your side doesn't mistake you for quota collateral. The best you can do is have a really nice car, but not too nice. Enough not to break down, but also not to draw attention. No flashy paint job or shining rims. Don't tint your windows, leave them open when weather permits. Draw no mystery. Hopefully, they'll fail to draw at all. We talk about enough, we fail to quantify. when I was younger, celebrating football victories, finals, dances, and, all, and I always knew when to leave, thought myself mystical, precognitive magic. I could see where the night was headed, typical disaster of too many boys competing for who's loudest or whatever. I realized the tension, hop in my car and drive home, music loud enough for my own little party, neighborhood trailing in my rear view. Me too busy headbanging to notice, just just moments later, the police would roll up, then my friends would turn into acrobats and track stars, and some of them were. Vaulting furniture, diving through windows, sprinting over lawns. I was never there to witness it, 
but I always heard about it the next week at school, reveled in their stories. I can recount how many of my friends got scrapes, bruises, how many broke themselves and other valuables, attended alcoholism programs, got grounded, fates that I evaded. Somehow I knew I would be safe leaving. Never questioning how loud my music was driving away from yet another rowdy party or what lie in the rear view mirror, ready, aimed. Where am I at? Wherever you want to be. Tell me. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna do three more. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, this one's called "Masculine Gay Does Straight Bar in Chicago." I had a nosebleed last night. It didn't slowly creep out like you do sometimes when you hear one of those awkward conversations. No, it came rushing out like the sense of guilt you feel for being like if you weren't there or you or alive, those heated discussions would be fruitless. And as the bar bathroom paper towels tried to stay the flow, my blood continued to find ways to escape. They become witness, evidence, accomplice. They know what happens once your bark is bested. These paper towels were trees, once were branches, were sticks. See, we faggot are tightly bundled stick discarded from our given family trees, developed a bond with the chill of the ground. We scrap a broken home. We, they try to make us whole again, pour in chemicals, mix to pulp, spray us onto their sieves, draining us of our nature, keeping what's moldable, then layer us, mat us down, roll us through pressure upon pressure upon pressure, squeezing until we are the desired. More chemicals burning us to the desired texture. <coughs> we are cut to the desired size packaged compactly and precisely, paper hugging paper shoved into the desired box, counting our lucky stars that we somehow fit. But no, we don't. And they still smell us, even in our thickest rasp, cologne, or muscles. We have the privilege of peace of mind when our backs are turned in the straight bar, or to forget when we go home alone, when we go alone to the bathroom, or safety or safety when three larger men corner us, allies, or anything else we could conjure outside of our bodies. Sometimes when we taste the blood in our mouths, we have to remember that we are tasting and alive, and we have a choice sometimes. So when I say I had a nosebleed last night, a nosebleed wasn't all, and I wasn't the only one. Yeah, I got in a lot of fights in Chicago, and one of them happened to be in a street bar. So that was, uh, that was fun. <laughs> I survived. Um, and let's uh, get a little, let's talk about a little bit. So this one's called God's Gifts or Not. I spent eight of my 26 believing that Santa Claus was real. Presents were, get, were his gift given for good life, given for living morally. One day, in a deep closet, I found neatly wrapped boxes, and I felt excitement overwhelm me. I, found, I had found treasure. I read the labels and became confused. The handwriting was familiar from Santa to Jordan, Mark, Calvin, brothers. Realizing it was way too early for Christmas presents, I understood. My parents, normal people, I'm sorry, I understood. Like revealing the Wizard of Oz, I understood my parents, normal people, controlled my behavior, controlled what gifts I deserved. I spent 18 of my 26 believing God was real and that life was his gift, given freely, given with love. I believed his word was truly his. Going to church and listening to sermon after sermon, I found neatly scribed words of hate past as valid discernment, people believing God's words on their tongue, God's presence within them, pure. I had 
I ignored history, turned a blind eye to the Crusades, they never ended. We see it every day when happiness becomes sacrilege. We see lives taken away. I've seen the face of God, Bible burnt eyes, gasoline soaked tongue, gunpowder dusted hands of the stranger, pointed fingers, index triggers. How many bodies does God need? 2010, not enough. 2001, any of the years. I spent 26 of my 26 being queer, and I still believe life is a gift, just not God's. So it's called skin. I feel like I'm the problem. I don't work out that often. This is my real hair. I am black. Both my parents are black. These are routine answers for first encounters with people who look like me and don't. I leave out the fact that a number of generations back, my grandmothers were raped by Irishmen. Their traits live on to intrigue. My skin tells me they like you. You see, I feel like I'm the problem. I can talk about the finer things. I can listen quietly, dancing in conversation so as not to frighten. My father called it putting on airs. I call it blending in. My presence commands pearly white smiles and excited eyes. I don't disappoint. People hug me. I am welcomed. I am safe to hide. My skin tells me this is how it works. See, I feel like I'm the problem. In these moments, I feel the burden of political correctness. I hold on to my moral convictions and glide through unchecked. My mother used to leave the news on way too long. I can say all the catchphrases, work harder, fiscal responsibility, just ignore it. Here words don't matter, we just spit the newest buzz. Here we are vain and shallow. My skin tells me, you know the walk and the talk. I feel like I'm the problem. My brother told me to always have an exit because it's only so long you can stand it. So long before grin and wear it becomes grin and bear it, before hand sets down the wine glass and becomes holstered fist. Then someone asks me, are you okay? When I'm turning as red as they do, are you okay? When the door slams and I'm in the hallway, am I okay? What is okay? My skin tells me you're not. I see there's a problem. I'm filled with a yearning for a privilege that I despise. I'm tired, so tired. If code switching is my advantage, then why does it feel like a crush, like an escape, like I dodged a bullet because I went to white school? While my friends were catching strays in the fashion of welfare, children, drugs. What is survivor's guilt? Why do I feel so alone? My skin tells me you're alone, and I'm the problem. I relive this fantasy every weekend. I le I've learned to forego my reality for brief moments of acceptance. I've become a jack of all shades, master of tongue, still lacking the spine to stand in my skin and demand to be seen truly. Is this okay? My skin tells me stay home. Mm. Thank you guys so much.